Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to give a bit of a whistle stop tour through circular economy um, and some of the work that's been happening over the past 12 months. It's really not possible to go into too much detail in 15 minutes. Um, so I've also included some resources at the end for further reading. So first off, what's the problem? Two years ago in 2020, for the first time in human history, human made products outweighed the total mass of all life on earth, which is quite a scary statistic. But what's arguably more scary is the impact of creating all those human, human made items. So we might see the shiny new building, but what we don't see is everything affected by creating and using that building. And I've included a few of these in the right hand diagram. Two of the key issues is the use of natural resources and biodiversity loss that comes with it. So as Will said earlier, the construction industry has a significant impact. According to the World Green Building Council, globally, the construction industry is responsible for 50% of extracted materials worldwide. Now in the UK, um, construction, demolition and excavation waste accounts for roughly 60% of all waste. And in 2018, the latest data available from DEFRA, that figure was 62%. And this is what we're doing to the planet. The methods we use to extract natural resources will become increasingly more complex, more dangerous and more expensive until eventually we face running out of them. And equally, at the same time, we could end up drowning in our own waste. So one of the ways to address this is to employ circular principles. Now, a circular economy is an alternative to a traditional linear economy in which we keep resources in use for as long as possible. We extract the maximum value from them while they're in use, and then we recover and regenerate products and materials at the end of each service life. So for example, a beam is reused multiple times as a beam without having to be recycled. So the energy from smelting it down and turning it into another piece of steel through recycling is avoided. The key point to remember is that we need to be keeping elements circulating in their highest value form for as long as possible. The circular economy is built around a set of principles as shown here. First of all, buildings should be designed for longevity and adaptability to facilitate building changes and lifetime extension. That doesn't mean over designing them for the future, but it's thinking about things like good floor to floor heights. Secondly, buildings should be designed for deconstruction so they can be taken apart and reused at end of life. And circular material selection is important. We need to know what's in our buildings and record that data so it can be utilized through the building's lifetime. We also need to know and predict what we're, is likely to happen to them at the end of life. And then finally, resource efficiency is absolutely fundamental to a circular economy. We must be using existing resources efficiently and using as little new resources as possible. Now, if we think about an existing asset in the current built environment, circularity follows the hierarchy that we've already seen a few times today. First and foremost, we need to maintain our existing assets well. If they no longer meet the user needs, then we should consider refurbishment and repurposing before we start thinking about knocking that asset down and building something new. And if we do decide the asset cannot be kept and modified, then we should be deconstructing that building and reusing the materials and components contained within it. And the aim is to minimise the use of finite virgin materials and minimise the waste that's being downcycled, landfilled or burnt. So reusing materials is how structural engineers can have the biggest impact now on the crises we face. So reuse of existing structures is commonplace and it's covered in guidance elsewhere. So today I'm just gonna focus on reuse of materials on and off site. Now in the UK, as we've already been talking about, reuse of structural materials has gained momentum in the past 18 months or so, particularly in London. Now this is being driven by market leading developers making commitments to drive down the carbon in their developments and reach net zero by some point in the future, usually 2030. Therefore, they've actually got quite excited about reusing existing materials, particularly steel. Primarily, it has to be said, because it's the way to have the biggest step change in A1 to A3 carbon emissions on a project, like I'm trying to indicate on this slide. But how do you actually go about incorporating secondhand materials in a design? Now, business as usual, as we all know, involves structural engineers designing from an almost infinite palette of materials. We select sizes and materials, put them on our drawings, and then the contractor goes and sources those materials for construction. 
With secondhand materials, there are different ways to incorporate them in the design process. We can do business as usual and leave the contractor to find the secondhand materials. We could performance specify rather than specifying specific elements. But what I'm seeing most is option C on this slide, where clients are sourcing secondhand materials and then designing with them. So either the client owns the materials already, or they're looking to secure these materials with a deposit early on in the design process. So which material is most popular at the moment? Well, steel is by far the most popular structural material for reuse, as we're seeing at the moment. We're finding a big demand from developers in London for reusing steel. And the biggest issue is actually supply. At the moment, there's not enough secondhand steel work available to satisfy the demand. And part of the reason for this is there's little incentive for a client demolishing a building to deconstruct and salvage steelwork unless they want to reuse it themselves. Now, here is an example that Elliot Wood is working on at the moment. It's for a big London developer who owns both sites that are shown here. And they're deconstructing the left-hand building to build a much larger building on the site. The building was constructed in the 1990s and is a steel frame with composite slabs. Now the aim is to salvage around 1200 tons of this steelwork, and we will then use 710 tons of it to create a new steel frame for a project in the West End of London. And any steel, steel that is suitable for reuse that we can't use will be used on other projects and anything unsuitable for reuse will be recycled as normal. Now, not only are we reducing the A1 to A3 embodied carbon for the receiving building, we're also reducing demand for the new steel. So I thought it'd be useful to explain the process we're going through on this project. We were actually lucky enough to have a full set of drawings for the donor building, which allowed us to do some early stage mapping between available steel sizes and the new build design that we already had. Um, in the donor building, we have long span beams about 14 meters, which actually meant we were able to improve the new build scheme by emitting a line of internal columns. The demo contractor had already been appointed when the decision to salvage the steel was taken by the clients. We therefore spent a few weeks on site surveying the existing steelwork in the building, verifying the steel sizes and lengths against the drawings. Now each element was given a unique identifier and linked to an inventory in Excel. We identified the steels we wanted to reuse for our new build and then worked through acceptance criteria with the demo contractor. In particular, we were concerned about damage to the steelwork as a result of breaking out the composite concrete slab. The steel is now in the process of being deconstructed as we speak. It's being sent to a company which will clean up the elements, remove old plates, assess and test the steel out using the SCI reuse of steel protocol. And the same company is storing the steel until the new build is fully designed. And the steel is then sent to the fabricator, at which point it becomes pretty much the same process as fabricating new steel work. Now, here are a couple of photos of the steel work that we've been reclaiming. Um, our engineers are on site two to three times a week overseeing this process, surveying, tagging the steels, and checking that all of the steel is being protected as it's transferred onto flatbed lorries. And as you can see, it's all in pretty good condition. Uh, there's loads more to say about this project. I just don't have time. Next Wednesday at the Structural Engineers Declare Summit, there'll be a much more in-depth session on this project if you're interested. So for now, I thought we should look at some of the other main structural materials. So for timber, the options for reuse uh, start with the lowest processing, lowest carbon option, which is re to reuse a timber element as it is, i.e. a joist as a joist. You could remanufacture it um, and cut it into smaller sections. There are some examples where reclaimed timber is reused, such as the Brighton Waste House, but we're clearly a long way from house builders starting to use reclaimed timber for their housing developments. So in the UK construction industry, reuse of timber doesn't happen that often. Uh, it seems this is primarily because of the high cost of labour in the UK. By the time a piece of timber is extracted from the building, denailed, stored and delivered somewhere else, the cost is potentially greater than buying new. Um, there is therefore lots of interest in using timber, which would normally be sent for recycling or biomass and creating engineered timber such as CLT and glue lamb from it. Now, upcycling of waste timber offers several potential benefits. By upcycling the timber into engineered products like glue and CLT, there's also the potential for the engineered timber to displace the use of steel and concrete. In the UK, it also offers the opportunity to create a supply chain for CLT and glue and manufacturing that is not reliant on virgin timber from elsewhere in Europe. But there are, of course, many challenges. 
The main ones based on the research undertaken to date seem to center on the process of denailing the timber and cataloging each piece. This is a very manual process, which if it's not done correctly, has the, damage, the potential to damage expensive timber manufacturing kit, which means that manufacturers are not that keen at the moment to be sending reclaimed timber through their production lines. So a quick look at masonry now. Um, assuming the masonry is in visually good condition, then it's the mortar type that tends to impact its salvage potential. Uh, traditional lime mortars tend to make it much easier to remove the mortar from bricks or blocks and now allow them to be reclaimed for future use. Um, if you've got stronger sand cement water, then it's more likely to damage the masonry units when you're removing the mortar. It's not to say it can't be done, but I would recommend that you do a test, um, a test sample first. I actually practiced what I preach back in June this year. We knocked down an unsafe 1930s garage in our back garden and then set about cleaning up all the bricks so we could reuse them. Um, it definitely took a lot of elbow grease and I can highly recommend a brick hammer for removing the mortar. But it was an incredibly satisfying process, which allowed us to build a new garden wall and save ourselves over a thousand pounds compared with buying new bricks. Reclaimed brickwork is often in demand in the UK and sometimes more expensive than new. Um, but reuse of masonry goes beyond reuse of individual bricks. On a recent project at Elliot Woods, we reclaimed block work from old industrial units, which were deconstructed to make way for new sustainable housing. We used the block work for the new beam and block ground floors, omitting the need to buy the need to buy any new blocks. And there's also examples where whole panels of brickwork have been used to create new facades, as per the right hand image. Often this requires a concrete backing, so we need to be careful about the carbon impacts of doing this, though. I want to just briefly cover concrete and um, reuse in situ is always top of the tree for reuse of concrete and it's often quite difficult to imagine what else we can do when a concrete frame building is slated for deconstruction or demolition. Um, business as usual is obviously at the bottom there, it tends to be crushed. However, in certain instances, there may be opportunity to reuse precast elements. The top right photo shows some precast concrete planks that have been reclaimed from a project in Sweden. There's also research being undertaken with respect to monolithic element reuse, where concrete uh, slabs or beams are cut up on site and then used to construct something like the footbridge in the photograph in the bottom right. So I think just don't completely discount it, try and be creative when it comes to concrete. So that was a quick run through materials. I think it's worth touching on pre-development audits. Um, we need to know what's in our buildings, but generally record information is poor. Uh, engineers are well placed to undertake pre-development audits at the beginning of a project and this is something we find ourselves doing more and more of. Um, there are, tend to be a planning requirement for many projects in London and the idea is that you should review the existing building, consider a full range of options for reusing the building both in situ and if this is not possible by deconstruction and reuse of components. So this is an example where we've done this um, based on some non-intrusive investigations because there, there were tenants in the buildings. We created an inventory of the materials in Excel. Um, we then used this information to inform the design of the new structure for the proposed development. The pivot table top left shows all of the timber elements um, grouped by length. And we were then able to apply these to the yellow shaded areas for the new scheme on the right. There was some timber left over based on ag aggregated quantities in the bottom left, which we suggested could be used for um, upcycling into secondary glue down. You have so, one minute. Yeah, Penny. I'm going to speed through these last few slides. I wanted to cover um, legal considerations, but I clearly don't have time to go into this. Um, but all I would say is the main takeaways from my discussions with insurers and lawyers is there is support for reuse of materials, but early collaboration is critical. Due diligence in terms of material testing is key um, for insurers and they need to understand the risk profile. So it's very much about speaking to them at the earliest opportunity. Um, the next two slides are just some guidance, uh, both on circular economy, the guide that Orlando mentioned that I'm working on at the moment, and some books, and then guidance on steel reuse. There's three key publications um, from the SCI and BCSA that are worth looking at. And then finally, everyone on this call can play their part, um, and here are a few suggestions of what you can do. If I had to pick the top three, then it'd be raise the issue of reuse with your clients, contractors, design teams. Uh, don't just let demolition happen without questioning it. And please share knowledge and collaborate. Thank you very much.